you just, I mean, I can just, I'll just jump in. I mean, I don't really need to do any bigger introduction or anything like that. So it's not a whole lot to know. Um, but I'm Melissa Palou and my husband, Devin and I, he is um, in the other part of the house uh, doing homework with our seven year old. So, um, but we, we uh, co, co lead um, the Ratio Christie chapter at Winthrop University. And then we do some work at the community college too here. And then a college prep, a, a youth, a youth ratio Christie group. So, um, yeah, we've been with uh, with ratio. Um, John, I think are you? Oh, have you been longer than me? Because I think it's been. I know for us, it's been about seven and a, seven years. I think seven I'm and a half. A little bit ahead of you. A little bit ahead of me. Seven I think and a half. Two thousand twelve. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think you were already. Yeah, yeah. you were already. Going, yeah. I met Blake at the conference. Matter of fact, is how. Okay. I did you? Okay. Yeah. So we had known Blake already through the sim through SES. That's where me and Devin um, kind of got integrated into Russia Christie and stuff. And and then they recruited us in. So yeah. But um, that's cool. I'm I'm glad to be with you guys. And you know, <clears throat> talking about this topic of critical theory. I can do me focus on critical race theory primarily. Um, it's 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 one of the same. Well, critical theory. I mean, critical race theory is one part of it, but either way, it's the same material. You just kind of apply a racial component to it. But I can do. I, I can just zero in on critical race theory. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd prefer you zero in on critical race theory. Okay, really, it's, it's pretty timely. I mean, yeah. I, and I hear it a lot. I've right. never even heard of just like critical theory by right. itself in fact so gotcha yeah exactly it's, you mostly hear of it as critical yeah you mostly most people's introduction to critical theory is through critical race theory um but then when you get into it you find out oh man like into the sociology departments and things um you know you see that the that's where you see like the queer studies and um the whole with the um, uh, quit, uh critical gender and um all these things like that the feminist critical um feminist theory and things like that that are very much intertwined with with this so um it's it's all very 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 entwined but let's just yeah i'll, I'll kind of go over just some general thoughts and then we what i'll do is kind of lay out um the dynamics and then we'll look at with what i guess what what most of us who are addressing this, most of us who are addressing this are Christians or, or who are critiquing the theory itself are Christians. Um, although you do have James Lindsay just wrote a book. He's great. He's not a Christian. Um, cynical theories and how, uh, what is it? How academia made everything about race, gender, and identity, sexual identity or something of that nature. I don't have it yet, but um, I've just heard great things about it. But his, his, all of his work that I've read and um, his articles and everything are great. And he's not a believer, but he's an academia and he's um, really exposing the problems. But um, specifically for Christians and as Christian apologists, um, we want to, you know, examine if these uh, if these theories are compatible with with Christianity, um, because. Uh, one of the main reasons that we are addressing it and talking about it more and more is because it has completely infiltrated the church. Um, it is completely uh, critical race theory. Any pretty much when you go and Google Amazon or anywhere and you look for um, books on the Bible and race or racial uh, biblical racial reconciliation or anything of that nature, um, pretty much every book that's going to come up is going to have um, some sort of uh, critical race theory intertwined within uh, within the book, um, and so it's just it's just very much a part of, of the church now. Um, and so I'm I'm seeing honestly um, I'm seeing churches that are splitting. Um, I'm seeing um, I'm seeing families that are splitting. Believe it or not, I'm actually going on. Um, to discuss this next week um, with uh, on all the things show another Christian podcast and they um, we're talking about interracial marriage and that and how um, CRT and I'll and I'll probably just say use CRT from here on out so you guys know that's critical race theory but um, but CRT is really affecting relationships like friendships 
um, marriages, interracial marriages, things of that nature. So it's um, very, um, it's a very pertinent and important topic to um, have some, some, some level of familiarity with, you know. Um, and there are unfortunately not a lot of Christ, um, what we would consider non-CRT biblical resources out currently. Um, so, um, but um, there are some that are coming out though. There's, there's some in the works, thankfully, that'll be out very soon. Um, but, okay, so let's just go back to kind of where this came from. And it came from the Frankfurt School in the 1930s. Um, the, Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School focused on um, these scholars there, focused on the idea of liberation from oppression. Um, you know, any sort of oppression, perceived domination, uh, freeing society from those things. So, you know, that can affect, you know, primarily things like economics, social structures, things of that nature. So from that, it just streamed into all different areas of academia and such. So uh, the idea, the basic premise, again, if we're talking about the Frankfurt School, um, liberation from oppression and domination, the whole idea of critical race theory, um, a critical, I'll say critical theory in general, is you see and view the world through the, eye, through the lens of power, okay? Power and the and oppression. And so I'm going to look at the worldview, kind of the worldview of it, and then look at some of like the epistemology. Um, so the worldview is, is basically, again, everything is viewed through the, through the lens of power and oppression. Um, this is how we would define power um, and dominance. Uh, it's defined hegemonically. So hegemonic power, um, and this is, it's important because when we're talking about race, for instance, and we use the term minorities, um, those terms can actually mean the opposite of what we're talking, what the theory itself is espousing. So we'll talk about, let's talk about hegemonic power. Um, it's basically the ruling or dominant class, you know, uh, structure, um, those in, um, the power in political or social context. Okay, so, um, and you'll see how with race, how this works. Um, so with hegemonic power, the group of people who possess hegemonic power, they can be a minority numerically, but still possess hegemonic power, okay? So for instance, um, in South Africa, where you had apartheid for so long, but you had majority population were black people, but the um, the ruling class was were white. Okay, so in that sense, you had they would be considered, according to this theory, they would be considered to have that white class would be considered to have hegemonic power, even though they're technically a minority. So that's why that's why I was saying the terms can. Um, when you're talking about these issues and you're and when you're talking about minorities and saying power in that. Um, now minoritized, okay, you can have a minority that is minoritized, but you can also have a majority that is minoritized, if that makes any sense. So a minoritized group is a racial, ethnic, religious, a social subdivision of the society that is subordinate to the dominant group. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're talking about politics, finances, typically, and any, you know, any sort of social power. Um, and it has no regard to the size of the group. So again, you can have a majority population that is minoritized, um, but you can also have a minority group that has hegemonic power. So it's not, it's irrespective of, um, of numbers, okay? So that's, and again, I say that because in America, when we talk about non minorities, typically we're talking about, you know, we talk about a particular group. But in America, when we're talking about hegemonic power in the context of critical race theory, um, hegemonic power would be considered, um, if we're looking at this intersectionally, 
and I'll get to that term in a second, the group that will be referred to as having hegemonic power will be white men. Okay, and so even though white men make up only about 15% of the population, um, they would still be considered to have hegemonic power in our society. This is, I'm just giving you according to the theory, okay? And um, so intersectionality, we'll get into that a little bit because these groups can intertwine in different ways. If you're female, um, but you're white versus if you're black and a female versus if you're, you know, black, queer and a female. I mean, that's, there's all these different, um, you know, intersections that can happen that determine where you kind of fall on the spectrum of power. Okay, so does that make sense so far? Or did I confuse yes. Anybody? Okay, so this is basically the the basic worldview, the lens of critical race theory. Okay, power and oppression. So, um, so it's a, it's assumed that the um, that the power the cause, because remember with the Frankfurt School. The idea was a uh, lim elimination um, of domination, you know, and a power and oppression, because the um, assumption is that a group that has power, so to speak, is going to oppress other groups. Okay. Can I can I ask you a question really quick, Melissa? Sure, sure. sure. Um, yeah. so, so, what the Frankfurt School? Where was that at? Uh, that was in Germany. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't have my notes there. I'm sorry, but yeah, I was in Germany. Um, and I have the, I've read, I don't have them on my shelf now, but I've read some, uh, there's some scholars that, that um, uh, some different scholars that came out of there, but the the different genres that they, or not genres, but different areas of academia, um, it just flowed into all different areas. Um, uh, were, so were those, um... Were those like, was that like a Marxist school? Um, for the most part, that's what people would, would categorize them as. Um, they were for, because we, um, we'll get more into um, kind of those ideas that flowed from Frankfurt School and everything from critical theory is a direct, um, you can equate it with the Frankfurt School. But yeah, it was, uh, the, the idea is eliminating oppression, eliminating power, authority, um, which is very similar to Marxism, right? And that's why people would call critical theory like a cultural Marxism type of system. Um, some some consider that, some don't. There's kind of some, you know, inner debate about that and terminology and things like that. So, um, okay. So that's pretty much the worldview of it. And this is, um, we're, we'll get do like more of a, a Christian critique but um, you can understand how with worldviews, you know, um, there are how, why there's, I, well, you, I don't have to tell you guys why worldview is so important, right? And um, so people will say, you'll hear people say, well, it's just a, just a social theory, you know, but it's, it's literally a way of viewing the world and viewing people. And we'll see there's even a way of understanding knowledge a way of um, a way to some some sense of salvation, um, even so. A thing about um, with the 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 different power groups and the different or excuse me the different uh, the hegemonic groups and the minoritized groups um, is that the individual the individual's identity um, is inseparable from their group identity. Okay. So this is why, um, again, just remember oppressed group, oppressor group. So you're automatically um, uh, identified into one of those groups, right? And so and that can, you know, even, um, even if, if I'm going up against, if I'm, a, if I'm um, applying for a, a position, you know, against someone who is let's see let's say i'm a black female heterosexual she's black female queer i would i would still have some sort of sense of of power over her you know in a, in a social context so everything is is identified in those contexts okay um okay so 
let's go on to epistemology and how knowledge is obtained. Um, so th the basic idea is um, that lived experience is what is the driving force of this theory. So a person who is, who is um, an experienced oppression in, the, in this model, their experience is proof of these social, these, um, these contrasts in terms of oppression oppressor groups. Um, so instances of racism um, or perceived racism or even things such as um, disparities in, in terms of maybe economics, educational levels, private business ownership, home ownership, things of that nature. Um, these are all evidence of this oppression. Okay, so that does not take, so again, it doesn't take into account things like family structure, background, things of that nature. It just takes in what group that you are in and that you're, that you're identified with. And um, that's, how the, the, uh, that's how we know that these things are true because of these groups and these disparities that, that exist. Um, let's see. So lived experience is something that uh, typically cannot be questioned. Okay. So what I mean by that is that if I say, you know, living in this world as a black person is like this, then that is um, to be taken as somewhat of fact, because there, is, there isn't an objective um, notion of truth. It's all about lived experience, okay? Um, and, to, and, usually, and the lived experience would be the lived experience of those who would be in the oppressed class of people. And that's how we determine that, that these things are, are accurate, that they're reality. Um, okay, so does that part makes sense about the epistemology, even if you don't agree, or if you do agree, or, okay. So lived experience, okay, and then let's part three, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be um, adversarial identities. Adversarial identities is very much in a part of this in terms of this relationship between oppressed and oppressor. So there's this um, adversarial kind of um, component there where the, this power struggle is a part of, of this whole, of the whole theory. So power struggle between white and black is just this thing that's always going to exist um, unless we do something, okay? And what we do is our goal, our goal in critical race theory um, and critical theory in general is to create a system or have a, a society, a system, a culture where there, there is no uh, notion of power, okay? Where there is no notion of dominance, power, um, all of that is taken out of the equation um, and we don't have to worry about these adversarial um, components and relationships between these oppressed and oppressed class. So we're trying to eliminate the idea of oppressed or unoppressed classes of people, okay? Um, so you can see, you can see a little bit of um, the problems that can result from that being your, it's, it sounds good um, on, the, on the outskirts, right? Just, okay, let's just have a society where everyone, there's no power, um, power's evil. So let's just eliminate that, that all together. And again, you, we can, um, we'll discuss in a little bit just some of the major problems with that. Okay, and so how we do that, in a sense, how we liberate society um, and even ourselves is through a process called liberatory consciousness, okay? So liberatory consciousness is what in the lay, like in a layman's term would be considered like wokeness, okay? So becoming woke, by, by becoming woke, you begin to see and understand these ideas. Um, you understand that there's this dominant narrative in society and in culture, and that this dominant narrative is because of these 
this power group, okay? And so now you're seeing, oh man, this is, you know, all this is about power and authority. Um, and so you begin to see everything as a narrative. Every, pretty much everything that we, that's considered the norm in society is considered as a result of the influence of the hegemonic power group. Okay, I know that sounds, I know, go, give, give me some thoughts that are swirling in your heads or if it, does that make sense at all or? Do you think that this thoughts? exists? I mean, is this, do you agree with it? Yeah, I think I was reading Jake's face a little bit. I don't, yeah, I like to start kind of taking in. Um, but it's okay. You're good. Okay. Um, so yeah. So being woke, and I and I'm sure we've all like I said, we've all heard the term. We've all used the term. Again, it's just understanding these power structures all through society um, and in the world. And so how we view everything is now, in a sense, up for grabs. We need to rethink everything. We need to reevaluate everything and to see, um, and to, I guess I'll get, I'll, I'll get specific then. I need to understand the world according to the way that white people have colonized society in the world and even me, you know, how I live, how I think is a result of the colonization of, of white people. And so I need to go back and reevaluate everything and just rid myself of these ways of thinking um, of, of what would be considered whiteness. Whiteness is, um, it's interesting because I um, sometimes like in my, like I have, like talk about race in these different groups and stuff. And then, um, you know, talk, talk to, to white people and they're like, you know, I'm just me, you know, and I'm like, according to this theory, no, you're just like someone who you possess whiteness, you know, you have this power. Whiteness is associated with power and, and you have power of a culture, economics, everything. So according to critical race theory, <laughs> um, the problem in, in society is the dominant group and their ideology and your whiteness is an ideology. It's a whole ideology. So it's not just you being just this white person. There's this whole ideology about you being a white person that makes, that influences all of society, okay? So liberatory consciousness, we all become woke to this idea. And so not only do I become woke as a black person to like, oh man, my whole life's been kind of, I've been living through this, this false narrative my whole life, right? But you yourself become aware and woke of your whiteness, okay? And oh, and then you come to understand that, that your whiteness is really the problem, okay? Um, okay, any questions so far? Or does that make sense? Okay, I know it's just, it's interesting to think like that because most, People, um, I won't say most people, but people who live by biblical worldview don't don't think that way. Um, okay, so how do we go ahead? Somebody's gonna, oh. Oh. yeah, I was just going to ask. Do you feel that whiteness is basically the new equivalent of racism? Mm -hmm. It seems like there's been kind of a paradigm shift from simply not so much what I believe, but what I am. Yeah, absolutely. It's it you um. Because what happens, honestly, I mean, we, we don't have to go by these notes in order, you know, because this, this topic is so interesting, you know. Um, what ends up happening in this, in this quest to create this equality, right, where there's no power or anything, you in a sense do create a power stru structure where the, the, because we're trying to rid ourselves of the whiteness, um, everything else then becomes the power structure because if your whiteness shows up in society, if your whiteness, you're using your whiteness, your whiteness is a problem. So in a sense, then you become this minoritized 
oppressed class because your whiteness is seen as being bad. And so you as, as a white person, um, even though you don't live your life or you don't, you have an inter you don't internalize this idea of whiteness in any way. You're just who you are. The fact that you're white, your whiteness is bad. And so you can see how in, a, in this attempt to make things equal by ridding the society of this evil that, you know, this evil power you, you oppress, you know? And what we'll find is that when you, when we're talking about oppression, or perceived oppression. Um, and there's, I mean, let me, let me also back up here. Um, my, okay, I, my, my mom is from South Carolina. Um, I live in South Carolina. I've lived in the Carolinas my whole life as a black female. Um, I've lived in, I grew up in small town, North Carolina. Um, my mom grew up in small, a small town in South Carolina. She was literally, um, in the second grade when Brown versus Board of Education was passed and my mom went to segregated school for the first two years of her schooling. My, my mom's family were sharecroppers. Um, I come from a long line of, of um, that we trace that, you know, to, to slavery and to sharecropping and things like that. Um, my, my grandma worked, you know, as a, as a kind of house care, uh, May person and, and all that until she started having children. So my family is not immune from racism at all. So um, I just, I, I try to say that, share that because I'm not coming at this, um, I'm coming at this objectively though. I'm just examining this, this theory objectively and the experiences, but the experiences that my family has had are very real experiences. Um, but yeah, so I don't know why I kind of went there, but, but yeah, that's, um, yeah. But anyway, so the, the idea of, of, um, I think I'm trying to think why I was going there. Cause there was a thought that was in my head about oppression. Oh, oppression. Okay. When we're talking about the whiteness and all that, and could that be like the oppressed kind of class and that kind of thing? Yes. Because what you find is that when we're talking about oppression, um, whether there is actual oppression, um, or, um, which in the case of Black Americans in this country, um, coming here in cattle slavery, um, you know, 400 years ago, that was obviously inhumane and that was oppression and, and what, um, what, what we went through in terms of, um, not only slavery, but post-slavery and civil rights and everything. So that was real, real oppression. I mean, that was legal um, um, through Jim Crow and things, through slavery and through Jim Crow laws. Um, but oppress oppressive groups tend to, when they are liberated to some extent, not even liberated, even within the oppressive systems, oppressed people will tend to oppress others within their oppressed groups. And even with freedoms from oppression, will oppress other groups. And this isn't just about black people, it's just, just mankind. <laughs> this is his world history, you know? It's just, we, you know, we think of America and we think of like our roots and like how we started with like slavery and all these things and everything that America's been through. And we think that this is like this unique society. And it's like, there's societies that have been through this, you know, but what, what we've gone through as a country. Um, and it's actually remarkable. I mean, when we think about honestly where we are from where we, how we started. Um, I mean, American Revolution, you know, being, you know, fighting for our freedom from England and then um, the slaves fighting for their own freedom. Um, and then uh, the descendants of slaves fighting for their freedom and like the world that we're in. Um, there, there are people who tell you that it's no better than it was 400 years ago. I don't want to go back 400 years ago and live as a black person. So, um, <laughs> I mean, if they think it's equal and we're no better off, then I mean, I don't, I wouldn't want to trade places personally. You know, I'm thankful for the struggles that people went through, but you know, I think that that's not that's that is not um, a, a genuine observation. Okay, so. Oh well, so oh, but, yeah. You know, Melissa, yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. I'm taking um, American legal history this uh -huh. semester as a perspective oh, class in law school. 
And you're absolutely right. I mean, the difference between where we are now as a country mm -hmm. versus where we were, what we were whenever we started is at, you cannot even compare them. And you it's can't. staggering, really, how the change that has taken place. So we've accomplished something mm -hmm. that no other society has that. ever accomplished in world history. It should be something right. that's been celebrated. So um, my, I have a question about sure. that. So it seems like this um, this way of looking at the world as sort of like a power hegemony where mm -hmm. you have a dominant class oppressing uh, a minority class in this instance, an, an oppressed minority class, mm -hmm. um, was accurate. Maybe even mm -hmm. at the time that the Frankfurt School kind of dreamed this up. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if it, if, okay, if you would agree with that, but then in the same sense, well, but then like, now it is not accurate anymore. Mm -hmm. well, like it's, the, it, yeah, and I think part of the problems is that, um, okay, so even as an individ the individual aspect of this, right? So we did have evil rule, evil people in power, right? Who enacted wicked rules, you know? Um, every society has unjust laws, um, but that doesn't, um, you know, as individuals though, you know, to judge every individual in light of that is the problem, right? So when you're judging a black, and it, and it goes to things like just judging, um, even, you know, even, even in the 60s, even during civil rights, I mean, there were people who were oppressed that did well, still did well, you know, um, economically, financially, things like that. I mean, you look, you know, we have, there's a, just the history, you know, a great black history there. Um, again, the problem is that the identity of each individual is is sep is not um, is identical with that class of of you know. So I automatically, as um, I view my I view the world through everything through oppression um, as a as a black person. So um, that that kind of, that gets at the core. It's like when you meet a so when you meet a even during during civil rights, there's already certain assumptions of each other. You know, when we meet each other as white and black people, um, that we already have. You know, that you're, you know, you have these aspects of whiteness, and that therefore um, you're part of the problem. You know, even if you're fighting against the problem, what have you. So. Um, and so let me let me flush out wokeness a little bit too because that kind of ties a little bit into this. Um, with wokeness, so you again understand that you're part of the problem because of whiteness, and I'm, I'm saying you because I'm talking to three white men, three white men. So <laughs> you realize that you're part of the problem, um, and then you see me as an oppressed person. Okay, that's how you view me as an oppressed person. And you have to use your power, what would be considered your privilege, to help me, okay? To help black people. That that is that is part of being woke. Okay. Um, this liberatory consciousness um, is achieved through social justice. Okay. So this is where social justice comes into play. Um, and there's a lot of debate within Christianity about social justice and is it Christian, is it non-Christian, like what is its role within Christianity, those sort of things. Um, social justice is basically just the elimination of social oppression to the point where power is shared. Okay, so social justice, for those who are, who have achieved liberatory consciousness or who are woke, their work then becomes social justice. That becomes their mission in life is to make the society one of no social oppression okay this is part of the whole world view um social justice the primary ethic of social justice is elevated to the that is the goal of society that is the height that is a heightened version virtue in society over every other virtue okay um Okay, so the adversarial identities, um, but yeah, also with that, Jake, it doesn't just, even even in the face of, of, of real oppression and racism, this theory um, 
in terms it 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 identifies adversarial adversarial um groups in that um but it doesn't it doesn't bring groups together okay so that's part of the problem it creates a constant adversary between these groups between the oppressed and oppressor group so let's talk about a couple other things okay do, 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 do. okay so uh one of the pro one of the main problems with with um this is this the idea of how we interpret how we understand the world um because remember there's no objectivity okay it's just the experiences of the people so um again if you live in a house in a better neighborhood than me that experience um has shaped you and framed you um me living in a poorer neighborhood has shaped me that experience is um if i interpret that as racism which completely is how we interpret every disparity in terms of poverty in terms of economics in terms of um incarceration rates in terms of every i mean literally everything every, everything in light of oppression and power um so my lived experience as a black person as a as a black minoritized person um not minority but a minoritized person so those remember those terms are distinctive um all of my experiences of oppression cannot be questioned nor really examined they're not up for grabs okay they're not up for for you to interpret them if you interpret them for me or if you say well maybe but it was that really oppression or racism or was that something else you know um that is exerting uh your dominance in the situation okay objectivity is out the window um this this is why you you hear that a lot right and these even in when these christian conferences happen on race and these talks and these forums and things they're so frustrating to me because it's not objective you know it's usually you know you have a panel of people and you'll have um they'll have a panel of black pastors or something um and i've learned this because i've i've been on them and i have been asked not to be back on them <laughs> um and you'll have a panel of these black religion you know christian leaders or or pastors and it's more like okay tell us about your experience and tell us how we are wrong and tell us what we can do you know there's no two-way conversation ever and so you can remember to ask a person you know is this when they say i've just been plagued with racism my whole life every day when i go everywhere people look at me differently everything i do i you know i feel like this people look at me people do this people do that uh, you can't you know that is not a questionable thing okay to question it is again to assert your racism and your and your authority um and some of the problems with that you know obviously from just a logical standpoint is that you know experiences are they're still up for interpretation experiences can be interpreted wrong right if you have a wrong interpretation of an experience um and you go with that if you go with that wrong interpretation then you have you know you've you've had an experience but your interpretation being wrong is now something that you're um you've taken with you and ran with and it, it's going to affect other it, it'll affect future experiences that you have because you're already you already have this interpretation of this experience um of these past experiences so you're going to take that with you you know we do as humans right we take our experiences with us throughout life so that's one of the problems um Melissa, why yes. think, where is, is this getting its footwork or why is it becoming so popular now um i think that um because of and, and um 
I think because of the the police brutality instances, the instances, the media, obviously. I mean, because it's been around, honestly. I, I mean, I remember, you know, doing um, uh, discussions about the like white privilege conferences in academia, like you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago, and and uh, being like, this is going to get in the church. Watch, you know, and here we are. But um, I think because of um, groups like Black Lives Matter and that and the pride movement and things of that nature, um, that these things are, are mainstream now, whereas they used to be kind of not like out there, fringe type movements and groups. And now that they're very mainstream it's and are it's very, it's what's that? It actually exists. I mean, it's not just. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, so these, yeah. So these groups have dom yeah. So these movements, um, I would say the political movements have dominance and it ties right into what's being taught in the social sciences, you know, in your um in your gender studies departments and any of your sociology and all of your social work. Um, and now it's in every area of academia. So, you know, for instance, uh, one of my friends who teaches in business. Um, and she teaches, I mean, it's, it's in business, it's in business ethics, it's in, um, you know, legal stuff. I mean, it's everywhere. So it's definitely in legal stuff. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. It's, it, it's literally everywhere because it's just, you, you automatically, it's a presupposition to any situation. If there's a despair, if there is a disparity of individuals or a difference in the individuals, you automatically... Think of, I mean, you just, um, you just, you see the, you, you're, you're trained to see one, one group or one person, even in a legal situation as in power and another not. Um, and your brain can just think that way. Um, and that's what this, what, that's what these things successfully do. And the problem is that with that is that we fail to be objective. We can fail to be objective, right? I can be like, oh, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm black, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm defending a black person, you know, I've got to fight for their justice, even if they did something wrong, because of the societal things that are going on around us, you know, um, and so you just begin to view everything in terms of that, and then you forget that there's individuals involved, um, and that there's objective, there's objectivity within situations and everything. And, and ultimately that there is a person that's um, made in God's image before you. You don't, you know, it just, if that, the first thing is a skin color and it's just, and, and I say this even for white people. I mean, it's not even, even, you know, I have friends that'll say, you know, I never really, you know, they won't say, I, they'll say I, I wasn't colorblind. I mean, I knew that, you know, it's black, white, Hispanic, but with all the media and the news and things and um, the way that we are being trained to think now, they're starting just to see color a lot more than they did before, you know, in every situation. And so, I mean, I just think that's unfortunate. I it's mean, important. some people, some people consider, some segments of society consider that as a win. I see that as unfortunate. Do you think it's on the same level as equal rights? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't know, it, it, yeah, I think so, yeah, it, it gets, and then with the, that's the thing, you, you, this is why, this is a little off topic, but when you're, um, with, like, things like Black Lives Matter and these movements that were, um, cr uh, created and started by queer individuals, um, and I use, I use the term queer because my friend, my gay friends say queer is okay to use. So I just use it. Some people say it's not, but my friends say, it, say it's okay. So, um, but when you have queer individuals um, who are part of, who started this, who are queer and black, um, think about the, you know, the intersectionality of that, that is ingrained in the movement, you know? And so this is why you'll see, I mean, at any Black Lives Matter rally, um, you see a lot of pride flags, a lot of the trans um, pride flags and things of that nature and the, the black trans lives matter, um, that stuff and everything. It all becomes intertwined um, 
yeah so mm -hmm. yeah well, this whole <laughs> yes so um what is the goal uh of this i mean if you're if you're if equality is what they're after how can we get more equal as a society i mean minorities are in every law firm they're in every business we just had a black president that served two full terms mm -hmm. what what more could you want they don't really, really want what, and how could you be more equal we're yeah. not as equal though they have yeah. to think god exists to want equality well th yeah that's a big problem yeah leaving god out of the whole equation is a huge problem but i'll be honest jake um, I don't see, an, there, that this is the problem with social justice as I see it, is that there is no end goal. And that's why it's, it's, it's so, it, that's why it's hung on so long. There, it's literally, it's perpetual. It will, it's it will perpetual. never end. And this is why, this is why it progresses too, right? This is why you go from, okay, we're gonna, I mean, let's think about, you know, Black Lives Matter in the beginning and then this is why we progress to burning, looting, tearing stuff down. You know, that's why it's the norm now, right? It was it, it, it wasn't before, but it is now. So we already know if there's a um, a march, you know, major marches, riots, and it, that it's going to be rioting, things like that. So, uh, but but you know, if you think of it that way, if you think of so think if you think of social justice as the savior of the world, and this is how we're going to liberate society. And these, these marches and these demonstrations are a part of that, right? I'm doing my social justice. I'm doing my part. Um, you can imagine if there's really no, because um, even when, even when, because you think about this, when they have, like when there's these police shootings, for instance, and these people get put in jail, like a police officer, like in, in um, with the George Floyd incident, when the police officer got put in jail, did the rioting stop, the looting and burning stop? No, it kept going for over a month. So this is, that's, you know, you ask yourself, you know, what is the goal here? And this is why as Christians, we have to be very careful and very discerning of the things that we involve ourselves in. Because uh, if there's no goal, if there's no end, you know, end in it all, um, there's no, ple there's honestly, there's no pleasing, um, you know, ultimate pleasing, then people are going to get angry and they're going to feel helpless and powerless. And then they're going to, that's when they're going to, that's when violence and things like that happen, right? People are feeling powerless because social justice doesn't offer what we think that we need, you know? Um, so that, yeah, that's a huge issue. Um, the, let's see, truth is truth. Okay. Truth is truth. So um, yeah, the social justice piece is, a huge part of this because again it becomes the, it almost becomes the savior or it does become the savior excuse me it's a worldview um so you have this you know you think about christian christian worldview this is a competing worldview when you look at how you live and how you what your purpose is you know um your purpose is honest your purpose is to make a society that has no um that where there's no power structures in place that is your goal in life. As a Christian, that is not our goal in life. As a Christian, do we want to help people? The Bible does talk about, you know, being there for the oppressed, right? There's, there's, there's scriptures about the oppressed and addressing that. But that is not our ultimate goal as Christians in this world, right? Ultimate goal in, in, as Christians in this world is to live out the gospel and to bring people into the kingdom of God. So you can get, the, this is why, um, like Alicia Childers, her new book, Another Gospel, that just came out. It's a very good book. And um, she was very much caught up in pro progressive Christianity. Um, social justice, and I'll say this. I mean, I can talk on a personal level, I've seen it. I've seen it. I think we've seen it on a national level with many Christian leaders, leaders in the Christian church. Um, when the preoccupation becomes with the social justice, at least ultimately to progressive Christianity. Um, well, you have per, you have social justice and then you have to be woke, right? To really get the social justice piece. So you adopt a sort of woke Christianity where you're worshiping Jesus, but your real work is um, 
not necessarily gospel focus, but a societal focus, right? And in, in justice, societal justice focus, social justice. Um, so you, what Christianity just leads to then why, you know, why just, why is Jesus the only way? Why is the Bible the only way of, no, you know, uh, of understanding the world? You know, if lived experience and, ob and objectivity goes out the window, or if lived experience or objectivity goes out the window with lived experience, then what does that do to the word of God in my eyes? It leads ultimately to progressive Christianity. And I think as Alicia talks about, the more you progress on a progressive Christianity um, and, and, and really you, you begin to um, lose those essentials of the faith because those things are objective truths. Um, um, go ahead, was somebody gonna say something? You mentioned <laughs> that, um... You mentioned that um, the minor minoritization seems to banish mm -hmm. the individual to the point where I have to look at you as strictly oppressed mm -hmm. and not as an individual person. Right. Um, that, is, that is a characteristic of Marxism. Absolutely. Do, do you believe Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization to its core? Absolutely. I mean, they said, as, you know, the, uh, I think, I don't know if you guys saw the, the clip where Patrice Cullors, who is a co-founder of Black Lives Matter, when she was asked in, in an interview, a few years ago, because um, she was being asked about kind of like the legacy of the past civil rights movement and like kind of where they fit in and what they're doing of the group and um, was that they were kind of aimless and that kind of thing. And she said, "No, we 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 are we're not tr we're not aimless. We are trained Marxists. You know, this is why, and that this is why we're Christians. It just kills me because we just we're ready to hashtag." We're ready to jump into anything. We're ready to be a part of any kind of movement. Ready and to post a black box on Instagram. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, your black profile picture. There is an ideology yeah. attached to everything. My daughter is seven years old and we're teaching, I mean, we have had to teach her that. You know, when you're being taught things and looking at things on TV, like we have to go through and be deliberate about what she's exposed to and, and help her to think through things. Everything has an ideology behind it. Why would we think that that something this big and this powerful does not, you know, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just being, you know, part of the, the I'm just marching, you know, I'm just hashtag and I'm just, no, you, you are, you are endorsing something. You are, you are becoming a part of something that. Yeah, really it almost, it, it almost sounds like just an arm twist, a gigantic arm twist, because if it you is. denounce it or if you don't support it, it makes you look horrible. It makes you look like you have no integrity or, or no decency. Because right. it's, it's, because people think it's strictly civil rights, right? And again, there is a, there is with the um, LGBT movement is is totally tied up in this. In fact, they're guiding um, Black Lives Matter. They're under their guiding principles. They have thirteen guiding principles. Now they have in the last few months, in the last couple of months, because it's been pointed out, they have updated their website and all this stuff, and they've taken certain things down. But for years on their website, their guiding principle was that the, um, the, they, the destruction of a nuclear family. And also number two guiding principle was about the inclusion of LGBT rights and persons being affirmed through this movement. That was one of their guiding principles, you know? So again, um, when you point this out to Christians, um, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, yeah, it does matter. It does matter. Absolutely it matters. You know, you're giving power and fuel to something that is completely opposed to what to our worldview and then going back to what you were saying about the um if you don't speak out right have you guys heard um the silence is violence um kind of saying so this is the new this is the new bullying tactic okay um if you don't say anything if you're not hashtagging if you're not putting your black profile pic you know the blackout profile picture if you're not marching, if you're not wearing your shirt, then that silence makes you complicit in racism and in a racist society. Okay, um, and there's some there's some thing. And if you're not out here, if you're not reading books like White Fragility, my my other books are up there. I have my I have my race books in a certain section. You know, my my heretical race books. Um, but um, if you're not re reading and digesting White Fragility and passing it out. That's a big thing. Passing books out and recommend book recommendations is huge. You'll see that um, 
you see Christians do that crap all the time. I just said crap, sorry. But you see Christians do that all the time. Oh, you, I read this. You got to read this, you know? Um, and then it just goes from there. And, and pastors are, um, are referencing it and making these recommendations. So if you're not reading the books, reading the articles, sharing the articles, if you're not shouting at your social media, um, then you are part of the problem. And um, from a Christian perspective, uh, being so to speak is a Christian is a Christian virtue. Um, being so to speak actually helps us to gather the necessary information that we need to to gather before saying things that may be just you know may not be true or that may be unclear or may lead others astray. Um, and you know the witness of Scripture. If we don't have, if we're not clear on something, if there's some murky, muddy waters. Um, the, the, you know, scriptures is, is, you know, be slow to speak, you know, and that's just, we want to be truth, uh, bearers of truth and, and we want to promote truth. So if you're unsure, don't, don't, you know, don't share that article just because it sounds okay. And it sounds right on the, on the, on the surface. Um, and also it, you know, it's about, again, don't be bullied. Our ultimate, um, our ultimate standard and ultimate person we ask to is to God. Um, and you can be solid about something um, because you don't believe it's true. You know, if you don't, if you don't buy into something, maybe it is better to be silent. Maybe you don't cause a big uproar and that kind of thing. So those are things just to think about. Um, we can discuss issues of, I, I mean, let's talk about racism let's talk about racial reconciliation, you know? Let's not bring, we don't have to bring in these assumptions and these secular social theories to do that. And unfortunately today it's one and the same. And I mean, you just, you'll find it, turn, when you hear terms like uh, intersectionality and privilege and um, uh, some of those, some of those key words, you know, it's like people automatically go there, you know, with these, with these thoughts. Um, let's see a few other things. A, 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 par, a huge part um, of the work and the social justice work um, is, you all probably hear my kid in the background. Sorry. Okay, she's gone now. <laughs> um, is dismantling norms. Okay, so remember, norms are bad because norms. The norm is a product of society adopting the ideology and the narrative of this this hegemonic group right so that would be considered our norm is the hegemonic system so this means you know when you do that um think about in society in our society right norms are what things like uh two plus two is four <laughs> you know objective truth objective morality um, let's see, on a societal level, uh, on a cultural level, marriage, two parents, two, a man and a woman, um, you know, children do best in a, in a two parent home, things of that nature. These, all of those norms, you know, of a society are really to be taken, thrown out the window. And then we were to kind of reevaluate those things. So you can see how, how just because something is a norm doesn't make it um, morally bad. Um, and there, maybe there's a higher, um, there's this higher general rule and authority, you know, that we're subjecting ourselves to, you know, um, but just logic, but even things, um, Western society and colonization, I've heard things like, you know, you, you, I've heard professors say that two plus two is five. I've heard people in academia say because we have adopted um, the, this, um, you know, westernized math system and this objective way of looking at everything. This is a very, very real thing in academia now. Um, but yeah, so things again, objective truth, objective morality, um, uh, things that are just basic you know, in a society that we know to be self-evident and things culturally that we know to be good. 
um, are in ethics are just thrown out the window. So if we're talking about power, right, and we're talking about um, can, if we're if we're viewing everything and everyone through a lens of power, um, can we truly be unified? And I think that's part of the problem, right? We can't be because we have we're looking at people in terms of groups and not individuals, and that is their primary identity. So when we look at the claims of Christianity, um, oh, let me also add about internalized oppression. I didn't talk about that. I talked about oppression from the white man, but a minoritized person has to come to the realization that, they, that they've been oppressed, right? That the world that they live in is a world of oppression. They're a product of that. They need to free themselves from basically everything, every, their, all their ideology, their way of thinking about things um, and become woke through this liberatory consciousness. Now, those of us who do not ascribe to that wokeness and to that liberatory consciousness, then we are just victims of internalized oppression, okay? So oppression can work, you know, both ways. It can work externally against others, but we can also oppress ourselves because we're stuck in these ways of thinking. Okay. So I've been I've been told that many, many times that I'm just espousing internalized oppression and things of that nature. That by marrying a white a white man, that that was a, a proof of my internalized oppression and my desire to fit into the society at large, things of that nature, um, by people who claim to be Christian as well. So that gives you an indication. Um, now Christianity, rather than look at individuals as part of power groups and dominance and things of that nature, Christianity identifies man as made in the image of God, not only that, but also as fallen creatures. So all, all humans, every human being, right? Adam and Eve were the first humans, they fell. So every human being has fallen, is part of, has a fallen nature. That is a biblical view of man, that we're created in God's image and likeness, yet uh, we are fallen spiritually, um, that we're sinners, but yet we are all, um, uh, capable of redemption through this through the sacrifice of jesus christ right so jesus even though we're 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 sinners um we can understand the gospel we can respond to the gospel things of that nature um and that's the beauty of christianity this is the the beauty of the christian worldview is that it does unite all individuals as those made in the image of god um, and those with a fallen image. So all people are, in, are image bearers of God. Um, and we're all in the same boat because we're all sinful. <laughs> so it's like, we're in this boat together. We're in this humanity boat together. We can, we can um, make it complicated by looking at each other through this lens and that lens. But at the end of the day, we're all in this boat called humanity together. And we're all in this world that has fallen and we all have these fallen hearts and natures that continually need Jesus. And the beauty of the Christian message and the Christian body is that we're, the redeemed in Christ are one, right? Not that we don't have different ethnic, ethnicities and traditions and things of that nature, but the oneness in Jesus um, far, um, is our, is our identity in Christ becomes our, our primary identity. Um, our color, our native uh, language, where we're from, how much money we make, those things are all accidental second things in our lives. Um, be, being a child of, of God uh, is our primary, primary identity. And so um, I, love, I love how in the book of John, or excuse me, in the book of Revelation, how when John, God gives John a glimpse into heaven and what it's like, and he 
um, on more than twice, he identifies those of every tongue, tribe, nation, language, singing, you know, and they're praising Jesus in this beautiful chorus, you know. I don't think that, that was accidental that, that the Lord allowed John to have that glimpse into heaven. It's something for us to look forward to because we don't have, obviously, the sin that divides us, um, but it just shows the unity in Christ, right? Um, so this is a message that Christianity brings to the world, to a divided world, um, is the unity in Jesus Christ and that he has died for all, all are worthy of his redemption um, and of his love and of his grace and of his mercy. Um, the work is not to, um, we can work for what we would call justice. What, I mean, I don't, this idea of social justice, it's just kind of a re, uh, redefined, rewrapped kind of thing. But justice is just justice. If we see something that's wrong, I mean, the right thing to do is to do something, you know, if we, if we can, if, if it's in our power to do something. Um, there's some injustice that we don't have the power to do anything about. But, you know, if we see someone doing something wrong, you know, wrong to, to someone or, or hurting someone in our presence, I mean, we can intervene in, on that person's behalf and, and you know, be a, a, um, an agent of justice. Justice is just justice, you know, it's just, justice is the nature, is, a, is it flows from the nature and attributes of God. So we can do that, um, but we don't have to sacrifice biblical truth to do so. And it doesn't become our primary work, our primary work again is spreading the gospel um, and giving light to those who are lost. Um, the work of social justice becomes a work in and of itself. It's a very, um, I think Jake, as, as we, as you kind of pointed out earlier, somewhat, it is a never-ending works-based cycle. Um, you will. This is why you see people who are very caught up in this or right, in the social justice movement. Well, what are you doing? Why are you silent? Why are you setting up? Why are you doing this? You, you, you. This is this is how they view their work is for you to do something to promote some their cause, whatever their cause is. That's how you prove that you're, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing work and it's never done. It's, and it's never enough. I have seen, I, I remember seeing, um, golly, was it, it was the NBA when the, you remember NBA did all this stuff with the Black Lives Matter on the, on the, on the court and all the, the, um, the players had some kind of message on their thing. And then they were having the names of black men who were killed by officers. Some were doing that on their shoes. And I just remember people saying, that's all, you know? And it's it's never enough. This is one thing you'll find in the movement. Um, and this is why, and this is in contrast to the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, where we can rest in him. The work um, is done on, on you know, Jesus has done the work of salvation on our behalf and we rest, you know, and we can have a clear, we can have a clear conscience because though there is, this world is fallen and things, we can have peace in Christ. Um, the social justice movement, this is why people are angrier and angrier and angrier because there is no peace in it. There is no, you know, it's always something. There's always work. There's, there's, because the reason guys is because there's always going to be injustice and things because we, and injustice is just sin right because we're in a fallen world and so we're not when we hear things about racism and i'm like how are you gonna you're not gonna end racism i mean you can end you can say maybe end i don't know in in certain um policies or something like that but i don't know how you change how you end racism by you can't end how people think, you know, you can help to, I don't know, you know, now that's a little different than things like, okay, let's pray to end abortion. I mean, we can pray to end, we can see a legalized end to abortion, you know, or you can, I mean, you can um, make police, um, poli change police policies and things like that. But when I hear things like end racism, I just kind of, I'm not saying that it's a bad goal or a bad idea, you know, or a bad slogan. I'm just saying that it just, it seems insurmountable when you're dealing with, 
wicked people like each other, you know, who we are, who will always, listen, we're always going to find something to divide over. We're always going to find something um, to, um, it, when we talk, again, when we were talking about oppression in terms of, when I was saying even oppressed groups oppress, even everybody, there's just this, it's just how we are. Um, you know, I think about the, um, you know, even let's go down to something very relevant when we talk about the issue of abortion and we talk about how, you know, women's rights and women's liberation, right? Because women did not have the right to vote and, you know, the, the ability to, um, to the same um, uh, equalities and, and opportunities that men did at one point in our society, right? So here we are where, um, you know, women, here we are fighting, you know, we, we, we're getting certain rights and we're moving in that direction and we're working towards, you know, being, you know, equal pay and, you know, equal pay for equal work, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and then we, and then here we get to 1973 and then we get to this issue of abortion and women's, you know, women's liberation, women's freedom, that must now include me having the right to, to terminate my pregnancy. Okay. So do you see how these things flow, right? And so it just moves and it moves. And so then I'm now, um, I know this isn't going to talk about abortion, but I'm now, I have the power as a woman now, I have power over this, over my baby, right? Over this, this, my fetus, my baby, you know, now, because he can't do anything. I can now make the choice to take his life out of my own convenience and my own choices. My body, my choice. That is a, people think that's just a slogan. That is literally a worldview and a religion to some people, you know, because of this idea of power and authority. It is a, it, it is a, a very internalized perception of power that people are, are seeking. And so for them, this, this right, to take away this right, this, we are fighting. I mean, look at those, look at those Supreme Court hearings last week. That was what was brought up over and over. You're just trying to take away women's rights. And here they're talking to a woman, you know, to, to Judge Barrett, you know. Um, <laughs> you're trying to take away women's reproductive rights and stuff. It is so mm -hmm. sacred to people. Um, and even within uh, minority, um, minoritized groups, um, any group will tell you that within those groups that there is oppression and, and racism of some extent, colorization in the black community. When I was growing up as a dark skinned black woman or black girl, dark skin was seen as very um, ugly. This is within black people, okay? The, the guys all dated the light skinned girls. Black was considered ugly. The, girl, the light skinned girls didn't want to hang out with the dark skinned girls. It was considered, you know, you get called names, monkey, and so, so this was within my own ethnic group, you know, so this is why I'm saying, I mean, we can point the finger, we can always point our fingers, but there's always going to be this, I talked to my friends, and my friends all over the world, in the Philippines, um, in Asia, um, my friend just did an internship in Asia, and the women there, that's why they have the little umbrella things to protect themselves from the sun, because they don't want to get dark, because then if they're dark, then they're perceived as being like more of a like migrant worker type of person, you know? So th it's in every single society, you know? Um, it's just because we're, man, because we're wicked. You know, we don't know how to, if we go back, you know, I, I always tell people, I, I try to go back and study the book of Genesis once a year because the foundation is so important. Again, that and when, you know, you learn about creation as a kid in the Bible, the creation story, and you learn about Noah's Ark, you learn about these things, and you're like, oh, okay, you know, you just, it's just kind of like a story, you know, but then you look at the world and how much, how far we are from that idea of being, you know, creation in God's image, um, and humanity and all of that, and you look at how we view the world now, and we just, now, but the Bible is archaic, though, you know, it's just, you know, that's just an old book, right? But here we are just hating people because of no reason, and that makes sense, you know? But, um, yeah, the Bible has, has really has, is a source of answers. Um, 
I know it's like 8 30 I've been talking forever okay I want to here's one here's one other thing to think about though before I hang before I get you guys off um we're in terms of if we're viewing the world in turn in everything in terms of the lens of power okay where does that leave things like um our um in terms of our own existence um our ancestry who we are um where does that leave the the system of a supreme creator who's creator of all who has complete sovereignty who can tell his creation what to do who has standards and rules that they must follow um who says that there's only one way to salvation if we're looking at things in terms of power and authority i mean who's the ultimate authority figure and power structure and power person or god right the sovereign so that, would, you think that would make him in that framework it would make god the ultimate enemy then absolutely like the, yeah. Absolutely. It's why in critical theory, Christianity is rejected. Absolutely. Because Christianity is viewed as just another attempt at power, another narrative of power. God being creator, telling us what to do, telling us how to live, telling us who we can sleep with, who we can't sleep with, you know, telling us how, how we should act and behave, giving us this so-called book that's, that's supposed to be read one way objectively, and that we're supposed to go by that, you know, think about, you know, if, if Western ideals that, which are just, you know, the ideas of logic and reasoning and things like that, but it's considered colonization in a sense now, um, that if, if that whole idea of objectivity, right and wrong, you know, the basic laws of logic, if these things are all things that we must rethink and reconsider, if they're even true or well, not even true but if they're just a it, true is not really something that you focus on it's the influence of the dominant hegemonic group so if these things you know just basic objectivity or or is a part as a product of this hegemonic group's colonization on ideology then how can we even read the Bible and understand it, you know, if we don't understand objectivity or if we reject objectivity? Um, it just means what I want it to mean, right? Um, so I don't have to necessarily follow that. Um, again, God becomes the ultimate um, dominant power, stru power structure, you know. Um, when he creates the family, that's a power structure. That should be thrown out. I mean, that, again, with the Black Lives Matter, one of their guiding principles was that they reject the modern nu nuclear family, you know, dismantling that, that structure, because that is a, that is a, a structure of power, you know, um, even though we know that kids do best in that structure, but, you know, no, we know better, you know, let's throw everything out. So then Christianity just becomes completely thrown out of the window. Um, and so this is why the church is, where we are <laughs> because we are now in this crisis of woke christianity um where people have adopted these ways of thinking and they think oh i'm just doing social justice and i'm just trying to help people along with it comes the ideology and this is in it along with it comes the woke theology the progressive christianity the ultimate um rejection of absolute truth and morality and then with that comes a rejection of power and authority, the reje rejection not only of the Bible and Christianity, but the objection of the idea of God altogether. So you can see, you know, just in a, you know, in a nutshell, how the worldviews collide completely and their view of man and their view of truth, um, the view of, you know, our purpose and salvation and things of that nature. So... But if you're a good social justice warrior, then that's what matters ultimately. Um, and you know, that that's your goal. So did I bore you guys enough or confuse you guys enough?
No, it was great, Melissa. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, there's no. this. Yeah, it's, I mean, honestly, just you can go as deep as you want in the readings and stuff, but you know, the basics are, you know, that's pretty much the basics. Neil Shinby stuff, Neil Shinby apologetics. I recommend his stuff. Um, we did a whole three hour discussion with him on our Rasha Christie Winthrop uh, over the summer, and I have that on our YouTube channel. Um, uh -huh. Answered all of our questions. Um, yeah. But that's pretty much it for the most part. Um, but just like I said, when you, uh, you know, I have a whole section of books up there that are coming out. And when you Google Christianity and race and things, it's just, again, White Fragility is, is one of the major books that, that has influenced society. New York Times bestseller, um, Robert, De Robin D'Angelo, who's a, a sociologist. And it's, um, I forget the subtitle, but it's the idea that, um, all white people are racist and you all you know all white people are, are uh, have some sense of superiority over everyone and that for you to question that is is a evidence of your white fragility oh it's why white people can't talk about race because they're the problem basically is her conclusion and even questioning even questioning that you're racist is showing that your your white fragility um also another book Abraham Kendi wrote a book a very popular book called how to be an anti-racist and um, anti-racism is another term that actually with um that was one of the things too postmodernism is a huge part of this because definitions are constantly changing um and things of that nature so uh racism even in Webster is going to be um updated to include not just ideas about superiority and discrimination but uh, um, power structures and uh, it's going to be more of an inclusive definition about um, you know institutional and systemic racism and all that stuff is going to be in Webster and their newest edition um, so when you say racism then you're automatically assuming certain things about society and structures and things um, but anti-racism is a new kind of movement and it's very much within the church um, and so they'll say it's not a, this is you'll hear people say things like oh well it's not enough to say that you're not racist um but remember you saying that you're racist is like racist too though but um it's not enough to say that you're not racist you must be anti-racism so you must be actively working in social justice to end racism if not then you're really i mean it, it you know it, it you you saying you're not racist is really it's meaningless it's absolutely meaningless. So anti-racism is the new thing. Um, so yeah, when you hear those things, I, I mean, I just heard a sermon that series that a friend's a friend's pastor did, and it was on anti-racism and things like that. We don't have this. Why do we do like? Why do we as a church do that? Why can't we just say racism and just be done with it? And just God created us equal. God created us in this image. When we don't adhere to that, when we look at our fellow man. Okay, racism. Why do we have to follow everything that the world does and says? And you know, yeah. The, um, when I was at, when I was at, when I was at Liberty, we uh -huh. had, we had to take courses in cultural engagement and apologetics, or apologetics and cultural engagement, and racism was a topic that came up. And it seems like the standard for racism only applies to a majority. Minority, by definition, can't be racist; only prejudiced. Absolutely. Is that really? Yeah, I, I forgot. Is yeah, I forgot to mention that. That is true. Yeah. Racism is, is viewed through the lens of power. Yeah. Go ahead. Finish what you said. I'm sorry. I'm going to cut you off. No, 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 you're good. No, you're good. Yeah. Racism is viewed through the lens of power. And so, yeah, technically a black person can't be racist or, you know, a minoritized person can't be racist because of that, that, that fact of that they don't possess the power to exert racism or to be racist. <laughs> Again, this is postmodernism at its best, right? You can't, you know, it, so it, de it depends upon the individual that's doing it, if it's racism or not. You know, scripture is, is clear about, you know, these things. And um, so it's, you're right, it does change and it does, and it, it, it's, what, what it does is it, it coddles people in their sin. It coddles a person that's, you know, when you say, oh, well, I can't be racist. I can, 
you know, <laughs> I can say and do what I want about white people, you know, and treat them any kind of way. I can't be racist, you know. I can do the exact um, same thing. I can do the exact same thing that I'm that they're guilty of and not be racist. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Instead of, you know, again, just viewing people as people. And so again, but that is a that is a, a influence of critical race theory, right? This idea of the hegemonic power and things and who can and who, who can be racist and who can be racist. I mean it it is some racist automatically because of their skin color and they do do racist things or they do act racist, then they're not going to repent of that. And that's going to be a barrier between them and their relationship with God. You know, so we shouldn't want that for people. I mean, it should be people truth. I'll say this too, that, I mean, you brought liberty. I'm not sure about liberty, but um, the majority of most of your, um, well, I'll say seminaries, your, your evangelical seminaries have very much adopted um, some form of critical theory in their, um, in everything. Um, and it has become a major concern for um, a lot of people who are donors and supporters to see this stuff happening. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to call it any names, you know, specifically, but I mean, it's very well known publicly that Viola is going through a very, a, a huge crisis with this. Um, and it's, it's a very public crisis that is going through in a shift in their some of their core values on this. And um, it was, yeah, one of the, uh, one of the chaplains actually, I watched a, a recent, it, it went, it went viral actually. Um, one of the chaplains, she spoke about uh, in their chapel service had taught from Matthew, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And she basically interpreted everything in that passage about you know, oppression and nothing, nothing about sin, nothing about right standing before God. It's about oppression and rescuing those who are oppressed. And it is, it was horrible. I mean, and people were literally like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Um, but many of your major seminaries are cranking out. Um, I'm Baptist. Many of our Baptist seminaries are cranking out social justice pastors um and yeah and many of our church many of the churches are dividing over this um because you have activists in the pulpit um who will not call will not say that if a black person they will not say if a black person commits racism that it's racism because simply because of them being black you know and things of that nature so it's just a mess you guys but um I Jesus died for sin Absolutely. You know, I think, but you know what, there are people, this is, I, we're talking about this so much. I don't want to, like, there are people that are literally caught up in this and don't realize that they're caught up in it, you know, and they're just regurgitating a lot of information and what they're being, what they're reading and what they're being told and what their peer groups are telling them. I, I was in a, in a Bible study group on race um, a few years ago, and it was, before it was before I really even started studying this stuff in depth, and I knew something was off. I'm like, this isn't this isn't good. And um, the more I started studying this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what they were teaching. And then I go back to the person who wrote the book, and they're like, yeah, endorsing all these books with CRT stuff in it and things like that. Um, so you have to be very careful and discerning. Um, yeah, it's a very sad situation, but. I do have um, people that I have talked to or reach and um, Neil Shinvey in the Center for Biblical Unity to Monique Dusan, she's doing a lot of good work with this. Um, she writes, writes a lot, speaks a lot. She's writing a book. She's writing a Bible study curriculum on biblical unity um, and she's black as well, but she was very much caught in critical, caught up in critical race theory and it affected her very bad. And she had to literally like deprogram from it because you know, she was a social worker by profession. Um, and this is why now you have associations. I have friends who have started associations of like Christian social workers and things like that um, to keep try to keep this stuff out of their brains so that they can still function, you know, in the social sciences, in their professions without taking in all of the poison with it, you know. Um, so it's just where we are, but I do get stuff from people who say, this has really helped me. I was going on that path. I was totally buying into that. I knew something was off and I didn't know what, and now I see. Um, 
a, a, a lot of, um, honestly, a lot of, a lot of white friends, you know, who are, um, try, they want to help, they want to do something, they feel guilty for some reason. We didn't even get into white guilt. That is another, another process of, of wokeness is your white guilt. Um, and so you, you, this is why you see so much about, uh, so it's so exhausting. White even a letter to white evangelicals, a letter to white, what 10 things white evangelicals need to do. Why are you even, you know, white people, what white people need to do, white people, this white people, that it is a, it's a, it's just reiterating what, what's called white guilt. And, um, you come in to realize that you're part of the problem and you're part of the, um, just you alone are part of the problem and that you have to, you have to come to my rescue. You know, I need you as a white person to come and stand up for me. And I find that very um, offensive. I find it very belittling. I find it very dehumanizing that I can't speak up for myself, you know, um, or that I need to be viewed as someone who needs you to do anything for me on my behalf you know it's just very it's very patronizing and it's it it comes off very disingenuous as well you know so it's a very very interesting topic and there's so much to, to it, again you see you start to see it once you once you know what it is there's a lot of people are like oh that's what that is you know oh okay you start to see bits and pieces of it a little bit of everywhere um but it's a whole the bits and pieces are part of a worldview that, and you see how the different parts work together with identifying the hegemonic group and the minoritized group and the, the adversarial identity and relationship between the two groups to the wokeness and the liberatory consciousness to the social justice, um, how it all works together like as a as one complete system, so. But yeah, I'll let you go. I see Seth, uh, yawn, I'm, I'm yawning about to. Pass out no, it's, not, it's not you. I've been oh, up I know. Since four. I'm I've been feeling up four. it. I, I, oh, I, I, oh, goodness. Yeah I, I, yeah, I get up in the morning every morning and go to work. So it's, not, it's not you. I, I love this. I love this lecture. Oh, I know. Just, I know. And, I know. And it's, a, and it's a breath of fresh air to hear a black lady tell me this, yeah. to be honest with yeah. you, because I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are a few of us, not a whole lot of us, but there are a few of us, and um, you just don't hear our voices um as the leading voices on race because obviously it doesn't affirm the narrative um but if you follow like on facebook and that and um it just started this year monique uh Desson started that group and it is taken off and she is man i'm telling she is I'm, I'm doing a book study with the group now with 20 people from around the country i mean just different things that were that are happening so God always has a remnant, you know, as hopeless as things always look. Um, I think that we are where we are in, in history right now for a purpose and for a reason. I think a lot of it is that God's pruning the church for sure. Um, and that we're going to see how things pan out. And the things, we'll see the things that he knew all along about the church and about us. And um, it's, I don't know what, I don't know what, what things are going to look like. Um Scary. Even next week after the selection, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> thankful, we're thankful for the media that continually divides us and continually brings the information to us how they would like us to to receive the information, um, and for their great marketing um, strategy to promote um, division as you know as as their economic you know uh, growth and potential you know. Have you guys seen the Babylon Bees um, new skits, news cartoons? I love, I love them. Oh my goodness, man, it's it's so perfect. It, yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Like wear a mask for your brain, protecting it from bad ideas. <laughs> they, I mean, they have a way of just showing how ridiculous that the ideas that we are um, embracing that we're seeing, you know, how ridiculous that they are. Um, but yeah, that, that is the thing. The media has a very vested interest in dividing us um, and, and making us enemies of each other. And this is why our headlines always reflect something of a racial nature. Um, they have to identify, because if they identify someone as a black in the, in the narrative and someone is white in the narrative, 
and we already know where our minds are going. We're going to get this idea of this marginalized person versus this person in power. And we don't even, we don't even need to read the article. We just, just from the title alone, we already know that it's an issue. You know, there's a problem there, you know, so. All right, guys. Well, I shall let you go. John, thanks for having me. Thank you. That Thank was you. very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you you know, so this, much. This, it's, it's not something that I would have paid attention to yeah. two years ago. I never even thought about it, but um, right. now I realize that it's something we better be paying attention to as a church. So yeah. and it's like very said, timely. Even, Thanks yeah. for your time. And even, yeah, even for, like I said, even for the, the terminology critical theory, even though people may not um, recognize or understand the term itself, the different aspects of it, we see it on a very everyday, regular basis. So it's good to be able to identify it at least. So, all right. Thanks, Melissa. Take care, you guys. All right. Thank you. God bless. Mm -hmm. Peace out, brother. Peace out.